God Valley is so much bigger than we all thought. Rocks Pirates, Roger Pirates, Roger Pirate in a straw hat, and a Rocks Pirate who we didn't know was a Rocks Pirate. And what it all comes down to is that the biggest event in modern One Piece history was orchestrated entirely by a child and some snails. This chapter is intimidating. It's almost too much. Even though a lot of it really is a glorified roll call, God Valley School has begun and we just need to make sure that all of our students are here, as well as introduce some new transfer students, particularly in Class Rocks. There is one panel above all others that blew me away in chapter 1096 because the sheer amount of weight and history contained within this one panel is absurd. Your eyes can dart all around it and instantly be transported back in time. I look at Kaido and I see Wano. I look at Shiki and he takes me back as about a decade ago to the Strong World era. Then I look at Whitebeard, I see Paramount War. And then what's that? Stussy, Stussy's on Whitebeard's shoulder. Yeah, I'm back to Egghead. But by far the biggest surprise here is Gloriosa, also known as Elder Nyon, although probably not at this time. A character who I think just about everyone had dismissed as a Rocks candidate, if they even remembered she existed at all. The most popular ideas tended to focus on Shaki being a Rocks member, which made sense because she was a pirate and she said that Garp had chased her. But I like this a lot more. Gloriosa is of course also a former Empress of Amazon Lily. The generational order goes Gloriosa, Shaki, and then Boa Hancock. But this makes so much sense because one of the only things that we actually know about Gloriosa is that she came down with a case of love sickness like Boa Hancock did with Luffy. And Gloriosa said that she survived the condition by fleeing Amazon Lily. Now, that's also how Boa Hancock survived. She left with Luffy and yes, she's still obsessed with him, but not in fatal physical condition. So who was it that Gloriosa fell for and followed off Amazon Lily. In the chapter, I was tempted to read this as Whitebeard because Gloriosa and Stussy do have that brief interaction. But for the sake of just, you know, putting this out there, is there a chance that Gloriosa was in love with Rox Dezebeck himself? Also, this fictional pirate content is sponsored by Quantum Vice, the specialist in protecting your mobile experience combined with aesthetic appeal. They feature a wide range of fantastic cases for One Piece fans in particular, with ever so many Gear 5th cases to choose from. One of my personal favorites being this one because I love the combination of colors. The white just pops and the red and black gives us some nice serious business vibes. I also don't think you can go wrong at all with a Gear 5th Luffy doing the classic Gear 2nd pose. Or now with one of the most iconic moments in One Piece, the Gear 5th introduction pose. I love it, I, I love all of them. But their range extends much further into One Piece as well as anime and manga in general. Featuring Dragon Ball, Naruto, Bleach, Demon Slayer and Jujutsu Kaisen cases as well. And currently there is a 30% discount off all anime cases. So you can and should click my link in the description to get a fantastic anime phone case. And thank you so much to Quantum Vice for sponsoring this channel and giving me the ability to bring you the best fictional pirate content possible. And of course, with a beautiful 30% discount on all anime cases just for you. So do that thing, but for now it's back to you, me. Is there a chance that Gloriosa was in love with Rox Dezebeck himself? Because the Rox Pirates are now balancing out a bit to me. There was a point where all we knew was that it was stacked with nefarious and sort of evil individuals and Whitebeard and also Whitebeard. But slowly, we're being introduced to more members who sit on the other end of the moral seesaw, like Stussy and like Gloriosa. It's such a curious group, and I can't help but feel like they weren't just bad for the sake of being bad. I could be overthinking things, but with this group of people, I, eh, I just don't know if it's that simple. And in this chapter, Rox even displays, or displays off screen, he displays your classic D-like behavior by just rushing off into battle all on your own, which is a trait that we've seen from Roger, Ace, and most prominently, of course, Luffy. All I know is chapter 1096 makes panels like this very, very trippy in retrospect because here Luffy is casually sitting with a former Rocks Pirate member saying, you really like newspapers, huh? Amongst the group, we also see Captain John, a man whose corpse we first met a very long time ago on Thriller Bark. And apart from the rotting flesh, he really doesn't look all that much different. As a bit of a TLDR, Captain John also goes on to form his own crew after God Valley and hides his own treasure, which Buggy was looking for. In fact, the armbands that Luffy gave Buggy during Impel Down was the map to Captain John's treasure. And that, th that that's what I mean when I can say I can look anywhere on this page and be transported anywhere back in time. Because my eye goes there, I see Captain John, and now I'm thinking about Thriller Bark, I'm thinking about Impel Down, I'm thinking about wherever Buggy fits in. I'm thinking about all of it because these characters are the foundation of One Piece. We also have close-ups of two new faces who are assumedly Silver Axe and Wang Zi, Wang Zi also known as Ochoku, the latter of which became the caretaker of Hachinosu until he was evicted by Blackbeard. Now, Rock 
Fox himself does not appear in the chapter, but he does speak. So this is a painfully slow burn process, but we are gradually building up the layers of rocks. And this means that in about a year from now, this chapter will be animated and we will actually get to hear rocks for the first time. The rocks pirates talk very vaguely about why they're on God Valley. I guess if you put two and two together, you might assume that it's for Kaido's devil fruit, but as powerful as it is, it feels like an underwhelming reason. But they were definitely after a devil fruit in one of those six chests. I just don't think it was Kaido's or Kuma's. And it may very well have been the Nika fruit, which somehow managed to slip away from everyone once again. Maybe that's why Roger was there. He took the chest thinking that, ah, this is the Nika fruit. This is the chosen fruit. This is good. But instead he opens chest and yeah, there's a baby. Now, speaking of, we see a young, but not the youngest Roger in this chapter, which is incredibly trippy. I feel like this image of him is sort of like discovering the missing link of Roger. He looks simultaneously like an older ace, but also very much like a modern day Shanks. It's as if men with inherited will all follow the same aesthetic tree. As a teenager, you look like Luffy, and then as a middle-aged man, you evolve into a Shanks. Although sadly, we don't really know the true final form of the tree because most people die before reaching it. Although looking like Ace, I mean, that makes all the sense in the world. But the Shanks resemblance, is that just me? I think that might just be me because of the straw hat. However, seeing Roger with the straw hat is unreasonably hype. This means that all of the Rocks Pirates did know of Roger's straw hat era. So you've really got to wonder if the former Rocks Pirate members recognized it when they all first met Luffy. It might even contribute to the, to the quite significant amount of hatred that say Big Mom shows Luffy. I mean, he did do a lot of horrible things to her. He destroyed her home, he ate her cake. But the fact that he has that straw hat, that just, mm, it makes things extra annoying. Or when Luffy meets Whitebeard at Marineford and stands next to him like they're equals. Whitebeard does clock the straw hat and it makes him think of Shanks, but is there more to it than that? Does he recognize that Shanks's hat was Roger's hat and therefore realizes that Luffy is the man Roger was waiting for? Hence why he went on to order his whole crew to protect Luffy with their lives. So this straw hat, it, it's cool, but it does create some inconsistencies. One thing this chapter does is raise a direct conflict with film Red, where we see the moment immediately after God Valley, where the Roger pirates open the chest and find baby Shanks. Roger is depicted here fully clad in moustache, as well as his captain's hat. And we now know that he had neither of which at the time. And I think this just continues to inform why I'm not a huge fan of the current trajectory of One Piece movies, because they're sold on containing exclusive information that hasn't been revealed in the manga yet. So what they do is they milk Oda's story teat for a modicum of material that wasn't ready to be revealed yet. And then when it is time to reveal it in the actual story, eh, Oda's changed his mind, which is a thing he's allowed to do. When you're writing a story, you can change things before before you've written them. I just wish the films didn't put so much pressure on One Piece to reveal this exclusive information before the story was actually ready to do so. And thus concludes my movie rant. Rayleigh looks more or less the same as he did during the Odin flashback, and we see the perpetual mystery man that is Copper Gaban, third in command of the Roger Pirates, and yet we still know next to nothing about him. The big dwarf looking dude is Millet Pine, and I think we might have Yui in the background as well. And then there's the big dude who people, including me, always get confused because Roger has two rather large rotund figures on his crew with very similar designs that are quite hard to tell apart in black and white. Seagull and Sunbell, their names are even kind of similar, but going by that nose, I believe we see Sunbell behind Roger, who is a fishman, although in episode zero, he was a human, further causing confusion with Seagull, who was and still is a human. It's always nice to see more of the Roger pirates though, because apart from the big three, the Roger, the Rayleigh, and the Scopper, the rest of them feel a bit like set dressing to me. I look at these guys and I know that these are supposed to be the Frankies, the Choppers, the Brooks, etc. They're supposed to be these insanely powerful and useful members of the Pirate King's crew, and I desperately want to know more about them, but all we ever see of them is a bit like filling a quota for a pirate crew. It's sort of like the idea that we need this big battle to happen, but we can't have that big battle take place as a, like a three on three, we need more. And so we fill it with extras. Although when One Piece is over, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was a Star Wars-esque expanded universe that develops, and we start seeing stories dedicated to these very minor but named characters because of their direct link to Roger. Which brings us to the key marines. And yes, I say marines plural because before we even get to Garp, Bogart is in the chapter, always nice to see him, and also a very rare appearance by former Fleet Admiral Kong. And one of my favorite panels in this chapter, I'm probably gonna say that a lot, there were a lot of favorites, but forget all of the epic action and group shots, I loved that one panel of Garp relaxing on vacation with the music and everything. It kind of reminds me of Cuker Island, which is where Mr. Three and Miss Goldenwick were first introduced. It could very much be that island. But Garp says something quite fascinating about the world government deliberately provoking Hachinosu, and he suspects that what Rox is doing is retribution for that. So again, I say maybe there's a lot more to this Rox business than we thought. With all of the information we have right now, it seems like it was the world government who shot
shot first. And that's, well, that's very much what they do, as usual, really. I swear they do nothing but create all of their own problems. And because Oda hasn't already given us enough characters in this chapter, we also have a glimpse of some of the Holy Knights. And even a family name, what is it, the Manmaya family? So we're slowly filling in that list of the 20 founding world government families. From the brief glimpses we get of them, I do like their designs though. And I also like the idea that the next time we see them, they're gonna be old grizzled veterans just like Garling. So this is like their first stage Pokemon evolutions. What we're seeing right here is the Char Lizards, and next time we're gonna get the full on Charizards. And it's only after all of that that I can even begin to talk about what this flashback is actually about. All of that, all of that was a detour. So no, we're not getting the full God Valley flashback. And I understand that many of you may feel a little blue balled by that, trust me, I get it. But also that's just classic One Piece. And I don't particularly hate the idea of gradually seeing a flashback in pieces from the perspective of those who were there. Like the next time we see a piece of God Valley, we might see Kuma, Ivankov and Ginny in the background. And at some stage, maybe we can Frankenstein the entire event together through these various fragments. All right, so the native hunting competition somehow gets even more sickening with the whole literally putting targets on their backs. It's that one simple act that fully dehumanizes the victims. It turns them more into equipment to be used for a sport. And also calling them rabbits, that, that is such a simple word, but every time they used it, I felt sick. And then further categorizing them into the rare rabbits and the 13 super rare rabbits. With that said, I have to admit, there's a bit of morbid curiosity in me wanting to know who the 13 super rares were. There's Kuma, of course, but I wonder what else constitutes a super rare rabbit. And just like that, I have also become a horrible person. But as it turns out, by far the most important character on God Valley was Ginny. I don't know exactly how old she is, but this child orchestrated the most impactful event in modern day history. In modern day fictional pirate history, I should qualify. But by leaking this information, Ginny brought down the rocks pirates, potentially saving the world. She also created Garp the hero and began a series of events that would birth the four emperors. Basically setting the stage for Luffy to rock up and become the Pirate King. All of this was done by a stupidly adorable child, and I especially loved the panel where she's picturing the two devil fruits with such an innocent imagination about how they both function. And Ginny's plan succeeds almost flawlessly, with a little bit of pushback from a rather large maternal figure. Before that though, the panel of Ivankov holding Kaido's devil fruit broke my mind brain. Because if things had gone just a tiny bit differently, we would now be living in a world where Emporio Ivankov Ivankov could turn into a mythical dragon, which I imagine would actually cause some conflict with the revolutionary army over who gets to be called dragon. My name is dragon, but you are a dragon. This is a problem. And to make up for Ivankov having Kaido's devil fruit, I think it would be only fair that Kaido be compensated with Ivankov's devil fruit. Actually, you know what? That genuinely sounds like a fun video idea. So there's a weird moment of perspective in the chapter when Big Mom attacks Ivankov because Ivankov is a massive kid and Big Mom is a massive woman. But because they're both on page together, they make each other look normal size. And you know what, Kuma's also there in the foreground as well. So this is three massive people all coming together to create the illusion of regular people. But Kuma does successfully consume his magical fruit. And this leads to a showdown with a very lone Saint Saturn, where Kuma solidifies himself as one of the greatest humans, or I guess buccaneers, just living things to have ever lived with a fantastic speech about how no one is more or less important than anyone else. And that he's going to use his newfound power to save as many people as he can which we've actually seen him do. He did exactly that on Sabadi. Actually, you know what? If Saturn had succeeded here, then weirdly, it probably would have stopped Luffy because Kuma wouldn't have been around to whisk the Straw Hats away during Sabadi. So this, this is another big moment. The rest of the chapter then abruptly cuts to a more peaceful life in the Sorbet Kingdom. And for such a massive installment packed with grand scale characters and world building, I think that this was very necessary. And I loved that we ended the chapter with two people just quietly enjoying a meal. I mean, when I say it like that, it seems a bit underwhelming, but it's all about context. This is a very simple act for most of us, something that we definitely take for granted. But for Kuma and Ginny, they've never been able to live anything close to this. So even something as simple as being able to eat until you're full is beyond their wildest dreams. This is heaven for them right now. And for the first time in, I don't know, perhaps ever, they're both allowed to drop their guard and release all of this built up emotion. One thing I did also appreciate was the mention of a certain big news Morgans. The kids were talking about how the god Valley incident was reported, and we've now confirmed for the first time that Big News Morgans was indeed in charge at the time. Which means that, as I've often speculated, Morgans was the one who invented the Pirate King title for Roger when he first published that article over a decade from this point. But other than that supreme albatross nugget, which reveals the 
premature extent of his global manipulation, the end of this chapter was very low key. And it was the exhale we needed after the sharp inhale of all of the God Valley stuff. I also find it quite telling that Kuma chose to live in a church. Every now and then One Piece does have some religious commentary, but it usually pertains to false gods. Like say Skypea, that had a lot of religious themes. And I think it's pretty clear that Kuma is being portrayed as a classic martyr, a completely selfless individual who has dedicated his life and his faith to helping others and making the world a better place. And I imagine this is also probably where he picked up his trademark Bible. And to continue going like full Jesus-y, Kuma is portrayed as a healer in this chapter as well, using his fruit abilities to take away the pain of the two kids. And those kids, by the way, are potentially very important because we've seen them before. They were actually both members of Jewelry Bonnie's crew who we first saw during Sabadi and last saw when the Blackbeard pirates defeated them. So they knew Kuma, they knew Ginny. In fact, then Ginny beat the crap out of them. But then something happened, something bad. Something that we're unfortunately going to see very soon. And as a result of that, these two characters dedicated themselves to Bonnie. But this chapter ends on a very sweet note. And it's a high that I think we should savor because it's probably not going to get any better from here. Yes, Kuma will eventually become the king of the Sorbet Kingdom, but Oda is building this castle just to knock it back down again. And by the end of this flashback, I have no doubt that Bartholomew Kuma will be one of the most beloved tragic characters in the entire series. Also, thanks again to Quantum Vice for sponsoring this video. By doing so, they are directly supporting my ability to bring you fictional pirate content with superb artwork as quickly and as stunningly as possible. So go show them some support through my link in the description.